Let me start by saying that somewhere in the world there is, uh, or there are, administrators and office workers banging their head on their tables and their desks because they've got some good ideas, but because of the, their bosses won't listen, those ideas don't get implemented and the same old, same old happens. Somewhere in uh, a hospital, or in many hospitals around the world, there are nurses and healthcare workers who are frustrated at the way that things don't improve. They take their ideas forward, nothing gets done, the same old, same old happens, and with the demands on healthcare as they are, things start to slip. And these people are professionals, and that upsets them. Somewhere in the world there is somebody holding on a support call with a telco because they went abroad on a holiday and they've got a bill for their data that they just don't understand. But the person on the other end has got them holding for an hour and nothing's happening. There's a major frustration if only things could be different. Somewhere there is a clean tech startup who have got a really great idea. They've not really articulated it well enough. It's going to be big, but people just don't get it and therefore they don't get any funding because there's nobody helping them get the way they need to be to develop their product. And right now, in Rio de Janeiro, there's a single mother who's just worked a 14-hour shift, and she's walking home, and she can see the construction site of the new Olympic Stadium. And she is wondering what the hell is in it for her, because she lives in a, in a ghetto, and her kids can't play on the streets. There's no sanitation. But she gets up and goes to work, and she sees the, the Olympic Stadium forming. So what's in that for her? And why is, it, why is it that this is this way? And it's because of this. Um, I, I went to a talk uh, a while ago uh, at a TED conference, and a guy called Sagata Mitra created a, a really great idea for building a school in the cloud. Now, he works a lot in India, and he talks about the imperial education system and the way that people in the empire were simply educated to feed the empire and to grow the empire. But let me back up a little bit. And he actually calls that the bureaucratic administrative machine. But 2,000 years ago, that wasn't the case. In fact, over 2,000 years ago, the Greeks had a very de democratic society, and they had something called agoras, where they met in town squares, and they sent their representatives from their own villages, and they created policy, civic policy, in a very de democratic manner, building out roads, building out streets, building out schools even, and creating well-being. And then that society collapsed, and the whole world went into darkness, and kings and royalty became the leaders, and everybody else was at the bottom. A feudal system was created. And that feudal system created the courts of the kings and the queens, and the courts of the kings and the queens doled out justice, as they saw it, but they also created, they innovated how they could feed themselves as a society. And that innovation was at that level. And then those courts created the administration engine of what corporations became. And those corporations became very top-down. My first job was as a chicken killer. And I was very good at killing chickens. But I saw a way of improving the way to kill chickens to make it more humane, because they suffer, or they used to in the old days when I was only 19 killing chickens. I won't tell you how to do it. But I went to my manager, my line manager at the time, and I said, look, I've got an idea. And he said to me, no word of a lie, when I want your opinion, I will give it to you. <laughs> and this seems to be the way, still in many organisations, even well-founded big organisations, this still seems to be the way. So why is that? You've all seen this sort of words. So... I've been guilty of this in many times when somebody's come up to me as a, as a CEO and a boss. What if we just, I, no, I haven't got time, we haven't got time, we're too busy, uh, we've thought about that already, uh, it doesn't work, we've tried something like that. 
all of, this, all of these pre-programmed excuses in leaders, or the average leader, there are some different ones, but the average, we're all too busy, things might not work, we've tried it before, etc., etc. And then there's this phenomenon, which is we are far too busy to stand still and try something else. This is probably one of the biggest barriers to innovation that you will ever see. So how do we change that? And we do that, we make those changes through the crowdsourcing of innovation. Um, I remember Nesta came up with a, a policy document seven years ago that called it everyday innovation, where you get big innovations that are one-offs that take years, serendipitous by maybe one or two people. But every day, you've got people with great ideas, but if they came together and collaborated, you could have little micro-changes all the time. You could create innovation all the time, and it would improve society. Now, you've all probably, there are, there are many people like me in this room, but there may be some people who are still learning. You'll hear phrases like crowdsourcing ideas, open innovation, co-creation, and ideation. And they're all a bit techy, those words. What this really means is this. So I did a talk um, at a TEDx conference a year ago, and I asked Hugh McLeod if I could use this diagram because it is so powerful. Um, the Hugh McLeod works with Gaping Void, and they do these inspirational cartoons. And for me, when I started my innovation company, Crowdicity, it wasn't to create a technical solution. It was to solve this problem, converting lots of information from individuals' minds and connecting those up to create usable knowledge. That's what made me create Crowdicity about four years and three months ago. It's very powerful. So I want to talk about some exemplars, because it's good to talk about exemplars. So fortunately, I have managed to do a lot of work in the NHS. One of our first customers was an NHS trust, and their chief executive was progressive. It's unusual to find progressive people in large organizations like that. And he created a community within his trust, and he set the first challenge. So my online, you've, you've all heard of online innovation platforms. My platform allows you to create challenges, invite audiences, address those challenges with ideas, discuss those ideas, and out, output and distill those ideas into usable solutions. He set the first challenge, which was, how do we reduce our dependence on email? It's, email is a major issue in NHS trusts. Because people CC everybody, they BCC everybody, there's a lot of covering their backs, let's put it nicely, and a lot of email is essentially you have to trawl through it and find out what's useful or not. And that, that first challenge, in 22 hours, 22 hours from that challenge launching, they found a major solution. Uh, I'll be brief about it. The brevity is important because it's about the person who found it. A young um, female operative in the IT department, completely young novice, happened to be at a conference about Microsoft Exchange Server. I'm trying to keep this non-techy. And basically, she listened to a very geeky talk about how to manage the Exchange Server at the command line level. And she found, by serendipity in that talk, a way of engineering the Exchange mail server to expire emails after a natural amount of time. And in the NHS, if you, certain emails, if you don't read them in time, they expire anyway. Their, their need is gone. Somebody else has dealt with it or it's gone into a different system. So they simply, after a certain amount of time, set the toggle on these emails and they disappear. So when somebody comes back at the end of the day, a consultant or nurse, all the stuff that's not important anymore or has gone away is out of their inbox which reduces the energy they spend reading email and doing email and responding to emails. That saved them hundreds of thousands of pounds in time and energy in that one instance of some young female IT engineer getting heard. And I'm telling you now, that would not have happened without an innovation platform. Equally, um, in an NHS, another NHS trust, um, a porter 
a hospital porter, and these are seen as the, they're the invisibles in hospitals, unfortunately. They do an amazing job, but they're the invisibles. And a porter had come up with an idea of how to save the dignity of patients. I'm sure many of us have been to hospital in the UK. We have these gowns that basically are open at the back. Your bum hangs out, and there's not a lot of dignity in them. And this porter came up with an idea of creating a, a gown that wrapped at the side like a, a Japanese kimono. And he put that into the system. And lo and behold, two years before, they'd already talked about something like that at a management level. But because the idea was re-stimulated again in the platform, it got taken up. Ben Delisi from the Design Council got involved, and they now are de developing a proper gown that saves the dignity of patients and wraps at the sides. Other things that happen in the NHS. They've found a way of delivering great quality across all of patient health care. They've even, they even crossed off where, where to put a cash point for the optimum health for a customer. So we get a call from the mayor of Rio, out of the blue. And the mayor of Rio um, had a major problem at the World Cup. Lots of disenfranchised people. They didn't think the World Cup was relevant to them because they couldn't even afford to go, and there were so much problems in Rio. He didn't want the same problem again, so he, a he asked if he could work with our platform. We found a design firm in Rio, and we crowdsourced the legacy of the Olympic Games. What a project. 23 great ideas that came out. But it wasn't just about working in the cloud in an idea platform. It was working on the streets of Rio as well. So they asked people in town halls. But they combined that data they collected online. And they, it was a virtuous circle. 20 ideas, it turned out they already were doing, and the population just hadn't been properly communicated to. The three ideas that weren't already being done turned into three major infrastructure projects that will serve the citizens of Rio for many years to come. That would not have happened without crowdsourcing. World Wildlife Fund, we worked with them. Uh, and they wanted to find a way of actually extending the money that people invested in the organisation or donated to actually create impact over a long term rather than just giving it to very small, specific projects. I need to do some slides. Here we go. Um, we get to this. I, I get engaged in my, in my own speaking. So um, the, um, the uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, they did an open innovation platform, and they got small businesses with ideas to put those ideas for clean technology and environmental change into the platform and invited all of their donors to join in and say, what do you like? Can we improve this? Nearly $4 million has now been invested in small businesses, small startups, to improve um, the ecology and, the, uh, and saving the world through the system. That would never have been done, and they would not have got the impact or reach if they hadn't done crowdsourcing. But again, the crowdsourcing is offline and online. And then we talk about, let's talk about something that is commercial, because crowdsourcing is great for public policy, uh, and it's good for citizen engagement, but you know, it also can make money and help with money. So um, we work with three telecoms. And you might have seen this advert, this guy. You might have seen that on the telly. Um, we did the whole of the crowdsourcing internally within the whole, the whole employee base from Mumbai to Maidenhead to crowdsource improvement in customer care and telecoms. They got 75% of the whole organization signed into the platform, and they are now delivering the best customer care in the UK. They even just won the best mobile service in the UK. They did that because they used this platform. They used crowdsourcing, not my platform. My platform's actually not that important. It's the act of doing crowdsourcing that is. So let me circle back around, because I want to leave room for some questions. The questions are probably more relevant. Um, Crowdsourcing is about taking individual pieces of information from individual people and connecting them together to create knowledge. And I truly believe that within every organization, there are ideas that get wasted, that never see the light of day. But with crowdsourcing and open innovation, you can ignite those ideas and set them free. I wanted to get to the end of that very quickly because Roland didn't leave time for questions.